Welcome to the second of five videos in our series on sense making. I'm Diane Johnson, a regional teacher partner with PEMSER, and I'm excited to help you and your colleagues deepen your understanding of sense making and science. Session two is centered around the question, how can I clarify the science ideas students should learn? Before we begin, take a minute to gather the materials we will use in this video session. They are linked in the description below. Please open or download a copy of the Science Ideas Note-Taking Organizer, the excerpt from a framework for K-12 science education, the standard analysis template, and the selected resources document. We will be accessing some different resources linked on this document in the orange colored section. Then take a minute to identify a standard or a bundle of standards to practice clarifying. If you are working in a PLC, you may want to divide up the standards for efficiency. You may also want a pen or a pencil or a highlighter handy if you prefer to work on hard copies. Pause the video and gather your resources. In session two, we will practice digging into the science concepts and the cross-cutting concepts, one of the important attributes of sense-making. Clarifying science ideas requires us to understand what the disciplinary core ideas are and are not in order to determine how to design and implement learning experiences for students. If you are working in a PLC, you will have an opportunity to reach a consensus understanding and to examine the effect of using disciplinary core ideas and cross-cutting concepts to develop and implement curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Finally, we'll practice clarifying a standard, or we could call it unpacking a standard, to help us make sound curriculum instruction and assessment decisions. Pause this video to take a minute to review your sense-making note-taking organizer from video one. What were some of the key takeaways for you? If you're working in a PLC, share these with your colleagues. To recap, in video one of this series, we deepened our understanding of what sense-making and science is by tapping into our prior knowledge, analyzing a classroom in which sense-making was occurring, and if working in a PLC, discussing this with our colleagues. You captured your ideas on an organizer that's shown on the slide. And additionally, you added ideas about supports that students might need and that teachers might need to use a sense-making frame for instruction successfully. As part of session one, we distinguish between an information frame and a sense-making frame for science instruction. We will continue to deepen our understanding of these distinctions of the two frames and gain knowledge, strategies, and support to help us do that in sessions two through five. Since our goal is always to improve student learning, we examined a graphic from the McGrail white paper entitled Student Learning That Sticks. We, we compared the findings summarized in it to a sense-making frame for instruction. We found that using a sense-making frame aligns more with our current understanding of how we learn than an information frame. I think this is especially important to consider when findings from classroom studies as cited in student learning that sticks show that students lose 90% of what they learn in 30 days. And to learn deeply, students need spaced practice and time to extend and apply the, year, the learning. Using a sense-making frame for instruction promotes deep learning. As we introduced in an overview in video one, this is a graphic that shows those attributes of sense-making. 
science ideas, phenomena, student ideas, and practices with the goal of equity in the science classroom, science for all. I'll end our review of video one with a succinct definition for sense-making from the NSTA publication, helping students make sense of the world using the next generation science and engineering practices to lead into our examination of each attribute. Sense-making is actively trying to figure out the way the world works for science questions and exploring how to create or alter things to achieve design goals for engineering questions. Our focus for session two is how can I clarify the science ideas students should learn. In a chapter entitled Teaching Practices that Support Student Sense Making in the 2019 Review of Research and Education, Fitzgerald and Palinskar noted that in addition to a range of teaching practices, including teacher questioning, making connections between activities and science ideas, tracking science ideas as they develop, increasing challenge for students, and differentiating instruction as needed. Successfully supporting students in sense making required a deep knowledge of science concepts and a deep knowledge of students by the teachers. So digging into the DCIs is an important step for teachers to take in preparation for supporting students' sense-making. An important distinction to note here is that science teachers understand their content. We want to dig into the DCIs to clarify what the standards spell out that our students should come to understand. Let's start by digging in to what a disciplinary core idea is. That's our first step in clarifying science ideas. So please access your science ideas note-taking organizer pictured on this slide. Capture your ideas about what a DCI is and is not on the science ideas note-taking organizer. I included the is not column because I find that I often think of what something isn't helps me to think about what it is. If you're working in a PLC, begin by allowing each member about three to five minutes to jot down their ideas on the organizer before discussing. Pause the video and capture your ideas on the organizer. Our first step in clarifying science ideas is deepening our understanding of a disciplinary core idea. I've included a description of DCIs from the NSTA publication, Disciplinary Core Ideas, Reshaping Teaching and Learning. Core ideas are powerful in that they are central to the disciplines of science, provide explanations of phenomena, and are the building blocks for learning within a discipline. Research in teaching and learning of science shows that teaching content in isolation from how to use it results in disconnected ideas that learners find difficult to use and apply. Again, thinking about the idea of deeper learning and that students forget 90% of what they've learned in 30 days if it's not deeply processed. So, that's the idea behind these big building blocks and not just knowing some isolated facts or memorizing definitions or equations. I'm gonna take just a minute 
to mention where to find the disciplinary core ideas. On the slide is a standards page from the Kentucky Academic for uh, the Kentucky Academic Standards for Science. At the top are the performance expectations, which are what students should be able to do by the end of the indicated grade level or grade band. These were written to inform large scale assessment. To inform classroom instruction and assessment, we want to focus on the foundation boxes under the PEs. The disciplinary core ideas are the center foundation box. I've included a link to the Kentucky Academic Standards for Science on your selected resources document in the orange section. We want to continue to consider why digging into the DCIs is so important. So return to your science ideas note-taking organizer and to the section comparing implications of using topics versus disciplinary core ideas on curriculum instruction and assessment as shown on this slide. So let's think about what are the implications of using DCIs versus topics on curriculum instruction and assessment. Individually, take a few minutes to brainstorm the implications of using DCIs to plan curriculum, to plan instruction, and to plan assessments, as opposed to using topics on the Science Ideas Note-Taking Organizer. In a one-sentence summary of your comparison, sum up what you think those distinctions are. If you're working in a PLC, do a round robin, share and compare, the unique ideas so that everyone can see them. Consider and discuss how these implications will affect your planning and implementation. So pause the video and take a few minutes to consider what would be different about curriculum, instruction, and assessment organized around disciplinary core ideas versus organization around a topic. So as you we're working on this, see how your ideas compare with my thinking. I was comparing implications for topics versus disciplinary core ideas using a sixth grade earth space systems um, standard 2-4. So thinking about just as a topic for the curriculum, that means I'm going to be focused mostly on facts. Uh, the students often don't go beyond a comprehension level of thinking because it's just focused on knowing some things. The activities students do are typically focused on facts. There are worksheets or readings to reinforce those. And typically the activities are planned first. Okay, these are the things we're gonna do in order for you to know this stuff. For instruction that's centered around a topic using this information frame, then facts and activities are centered around knowing things like what are the stages of the water cycle or label a diagram of the water cycle. Same kind of thinking for the assessment. It's based on facts and definitions. And so it might simply be just recalling those five stages of the water cycle or labeling a diagram of the water cycle like we practiced in class. If I'm organizing my curriculum around disciplinary core ideas, those concepts as building blocks and using a sense-making frame of instruction, then I do want kids to know some things, but those things they know, those facts they know are tools for under understanding concepts and generalizations. The activities focus on developing understanding and transferring concepts and ideas, not just knowing some things. Planning a unit starts with a big idea, a theme, a concept, a driving question, a phenomenon. 
the kids are going to figure out. And then activities are planned from there. So activities are the last thing that would be planned. For instruction, my activities would center around the specific topic of study, but concepts would drive the work. I'd want to lead students to a more sophisticated uh, understanding, a more abstract understanding of ideas, those cross-cutting concepts and disciplinary core ideas. And so my ultimate goal might for, be for students to be able to explain how and why the earth is constantly changing and not just what's the water cycle, label the stages of the water cycle. For assessment, students would use what they've learned in those generalization, but the emphasis would be on understanding and transferability. The assessments are typically open-ended where students would use their understanding and evidence to support their thinking or the claims that they make. Perhaps my assessment might be something like use a model to explain how mammoth caves formed to go along with this particular disciplinary core idea. So pause the video and reflect for a moment on what we've examined so far. What are DCIs? And maybe more importantly, how does using disciplinary core ideas affect how I consider curriculum, instruction, and assessment? What are some actions you will take as a result of thinking about this? If you're working in a PLC, share your thinking. So why this idea of clarity? And how do I go about clarifying science ideas? We know from research that teacher clarity has an effect size of 0.75. This is some of the research from Visible Learning by John Hattie. And that effect size of 0.75 means that it accelerates learning. A major part of teacher clarity is understanding what, st what students need to learn and identifying how they would know that they have learned it. To get there, teachers have to analyze standards and plan meaningful instruction and assessments. I chose to use some of the materials from the Teacher Clarity Playbook because I know that many schools and or districts are using this to kind of develop curricula, work on scope and sequences, to develop clear learning targets as well as success criteria. So I thought that this would be maybe a useful way to think about this for our science standards. This is just an overview of the process that we're going to use for clarifying science ideas. You'll notice on the right are some useful resources. Uh, appendices E and G. E um, contains the progressions for the big core ideas, and Appendix G contains the matrix, thus the progressions for the cross-cutting concepts. A framework for K-12 science education gives us lots of background and the big ideas and the way that the writers of the standards were considering them. The book from NSTA, Disciplinary Core Ideas, Reshaping Teaching and Learning, is also a very useful um, resource, as well as their latest book, Cross-Cutting Concepts, Strengthening Science and Engineering Learning. The Disciplinary Core Idea book and the Cross-Cutting Concept books are not essential for this process, but they are useful resources, so that's why I've included them. And then... I've also included um, kind of the NGSS toolkit for unpacking standards. So there's some organizers in there that you might find useful as well. On the left side of the screen, you see kind of the steps to take. I know that it looks maybe overwhelming and it looks like it's kind of linear, but really it's an iterative process. And it's a way of just digging in and making sense of those disciplinary core ideas to help us think 
how are we going to get kids to come to understand this? What's the most important things for the students to walk away with? And doing this process often helps me think about, oh, this might be the phenomenon I can use. And it always helps me to keep pushing on this idea of, oh, this is why kids need to know this. This is why it's important for a third grader to understand this or an eighth grader to understand this disciplinary core idea. So let's kind of begin by practicing an example. One of the things that you're going to want to access is the standards analysis template. Again, this is just a template for recording your ideas um, and keeping track of those. The other handy thing about this is once you've got all the information there, you can just kind of store it um, in a folder or on a virtual drive so that you can access it before teaching so that you can kind of wrap your head around those big ideas again and you don't have to go through the whole process of doing a standards analysis because you've already done that. So let's kind of start. I'm going to take you through a process and just kind of do a think aloud as I would complete the standards analysis organizer um, for a specific standard. So the first thing I would do in the, in the top part, number one, is just copy and paste in the standard, um, the performance expectation, I apologize. And in the second part, I would just simply go to the foundation box and copy and paste in the disciplinary core ideas from the foundation box, as well as the cross-cutting concepts. Then just to kind of pull out some of the big ideas that are present, I would highlight the nouns in one color. I would go through the performance expectation, the DCI and the cross-cutting concepts and highlight the nouns. As you can see from my example, I just used yellow to highlight. Once I've done that, I want to go back and say circle the verbs or highlight them in a different color just to distinguish those important pieces of the standard. Then I'm going to record my nouns down in the third step you see here and organize them you know, kind of categorize them. Where do these things fall? So I notice as I'm looking at these nouns that this idea of a model comes up. And some of the language around developing a model would be making sure that you could identify those components. What are the relationships between the components? And then what are the connections with those components and other systems perhaps? I also see this idea of cycling comes up and words that go along with that, that I want students to be able to use because it's a more precise way to communicate their understanding would be changes in form, transpiration, evaporation, condensation, crystallization, and precipitation. So as I'm helping them think about this idea of conservation of matter and matter cycling, those would be some of the terms that I'd want the students to develop the use of. In this particular standard, not every earth system is identified. They identify the land, ocean, and atmosphere. So those would be the ones that I would concentrate on in this particular lesson sequence or unit of study. Other nouns would be energy, specifically energy from the sun. Big ideas about energy would be this transfer of energy. How is it transferred from the sun and then what effect does it have on water? And then this force of gravity and how that affects water, thus our systems. The big verbs that show up are develop, describe, driven or propelled, and cycles. So those are things that I want to keep in mind and have students doing. So that just is a simple way to take the standard, the PE, the disciplinary core ideas and the cross-cutting concepts and kind of look for what are the pieces of these that might be important and that can inform 
instruction and what I want students to be able to use to figure out a phenomenon. So after I've identified my standard and done the standard analysis, I want to kind of think about, well, what's the big idea that's being developed here? And a useful resource for this is going to be Appendix G. So in Appendix G, I'm looking at the progression of kind of the big core idea for each of those core ideas in the disciplines, earth, life, and physical science. So I've excerpted a little piece from Appendix E, and let's just look at the top part, ESS2.C, the roles of water in Earth surfaces process, in Earth's surface processes. That's the one we'll just focus on for now. And notice how the ideas progress. At K12, just noticing that water is found in many places, and it's also in different forms in different places on Earth. Then in the grades three through five, notice that, or come to the conclusion that most of Earth's water is in the ocean, and much of the Earth's fresh water is in glaciers or underground. So notice the increasing level of abstraction that we're getting here. Then by the sixth through eighth grade band, now we're going to be thinking about this idea of cycling, you know, conservation of matter, um, that matter can exist in different states based on the amount of energy that's in that system. So water cycles among the land, ocean, and atmosphere. And the driving force behind this cycling, the energy behind this cycling, comes from the sunlight and gravity. Also, that there are some changes in how it cycles, how energy cycles in water. And that's based on density variations, which is gonna drive ocean currents, which is gonna impact um, other earth systems. And then also water movement causes weathering and erosion, which changes landscape features. So notice now we're really getting into specific causal mechanisms at the middle school level. And then by high school, we go to the much more nanoscopic thinking because now we've got to understand why these unique properties of water are so important for causing all of these different changes that we observe on Earth's surface. So you begin to see that progression of ideas and kind of think about what's important at this particular grade band for students to walk away understanding. The next thing would be to read descriptions about the core idea from the framework. And if you have the disciplinary core idea book, the uh, related excerpt in the DCI book is helpful as well. But the framework is free. So it's the place where we start. It's what's used to develop our standards. And often it'll have um, all the information that you need. So in looking at the framework and thinking around that Earth and Space System standard um, that I've kind of focused on here as an example, this is a direct quote from the framework. The second core idea, ESS2, Earth Systems, encompasses the processes that drive Earth's conditions and its continual evolution, change over time. It addresses the planet's large-scale structure and composition, describes its individual systems, and explains how they're interrelated. It also focuses on the mechanism driving Earth's internal motions and on the vital role that water plays in all of the planet's systems and surface processes. So again, notice how those big ideas that we saw being developed across um, the disciplinary core idea progression are ad addressed in this overview paragraph. This is just a big statement of things. Now let's go down to maybe the more nitty gritty from this um, core idea, ESS2, Earth Systems, and from the framework, the question that's kind of guiding um, 
all these considerations. How do we decide what was core? Or all of those things that help us understand how and why the earth is constantly changing. So considering those important ideas from that middle school band that I was focusing on, some things that really stood out to me are, I've got to help my students understand this set of interconnected systems. Now in the sixth grade standard, only three of those four Earth systems are mentioned. The geosphere, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere. The biosphere is not mentioned in that standard. And so that's going to come in at another point in time. Another thing that I'm going to want students to think about is the range of time for which some of these changes occur. Some occur so quickly, and then some take hundreds, thousands, millions of years to occur. So we want to understand that scale as well as the spatial scale. And these are hard things for any of us to understand, let alone a sixth grader. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm reading that, it's like, okay, these are really important and could be real important for my students to walk away with an in-depth understanding. And then I want them to understand that all of these processes are a result of energy flowing and matter cycling within and among these systems. So this big idea of energy transfer, transformation, matter cycling, and conservation is very important. Now, part of this goes to tectonic plates. And that's not what I was focusing on for this part. I was more focusing on um, the Earth's landscape, and the impact that water has on that. So I'm going to go down and look at just this. Water is essential to the, to the dynamics of most Earth systems and plays a significant role in shaping Earth landscapes. So this is going to be um, kind of where I'm going to emphasize for this particular study for my students. And I've copied and pasted. I just copied and pasted this information in. I uh, would use a strike through for things that I wasn't considering in this unit of study on that standards analysis template. So I've got all of that information in one place for easy reference. And now one of the things that I have found in um, my position of being able to go into lots of classrooms and make observations is when I watch students and they seem to be confused, it's often because of a cross-cutting concept. We're not, we haven't clearly defined the system or we're not thinking about um, matter and energy flows and cycles or causal mechanisms. It's some of those big thinking ideas aren't there. So I have found if I put the cross-cutting concept element that kind of I think will be really important for students to understand in this clarification, it, it helps me to remember to really develop those with my students and why they're so important for the development. So in order to do that, I might use Appendix G, which is um, the matrix that shows the development, the progression of those elements for the cross-cutting concepts. And then another nice resource is the cross-cutting concepts book from NSTA. You don't need that book, but it's another resource if you were to have it. So the next step in this process would be to look at the cross-cutting concepts. Um, that might be really important to help my students understand this idea of Earth systems and water cycling. So I've just pulled up um, one of the matrix sheets and I've circled the cross-cutting concept of energy and matter, flows, cycles, and conservation, because that was one that was identified in that standard statement. And then as I looked through the six, eight grade band, one, and looked at each of those elements, each of those bulleted items, it seemed that that second bulleted item was the one that was really going to be useful for my students to use as a thinking lens. Within a natural, in, this, in a natural system, your system, we're not looking at an engineering or a design system here, the transfer of energy drives the motion and or cycling of matter. So that's something that 
I really want to emphasize is it's not so much labeling where transpiration and precipitation and evaporation and crystallization might occur, but those energy changes that are driving that and how that's facilitating the cycling. So that would be, I think, an important thinking lens for my students to use. And then I think there's probably many here that would come into play, but another one would be thinking about systems and system models. And because we're looking at different earth systems, I would want my students to be able to identify those systems. And then what are the important components in those systems that might come into play as we look at changes in earth systems? So when I looked through the elements at the middle school level, that middle one seemed to stand out to, as being very useful. Models can be used to represent systems and their interactions, such as inputs. So, oh, thinking about this energy input that would drive this process. Oh, what are those processes? Those are the things like evaporation, transpiration, precipitation, and then the outputs. Where would those changes be occurring? and the energy, matter, and information flows within the system. So really helping students clarify the systems, the components, the boundaries, and the interactions, I think would be a help, uh, helpful lens. So I would just copy and paste these two elements into that standards analysis template just to help me stay focused on that. And then this next part would be to think about potential student challenges. You know, where are some problems in thinking going to be? We've already mentioned a few as we've gone through this example, standard analysis. Um, materials from NSTA on unpacking the next gen science standards, notice do similar steps to what we've been doing, but bring out this idea of student challenges, which was not in that uh, student clarity playbook. And so where might I get some of these different ideas for student challenges? Um, I might go to the benchmarks um, the, for science literacy from Project 2061. They often have a range of different misconceptions that students hold there. I could go to, um, the framework. There's a book called Making Sense of Secondary Science that shares a lot of the misconception research that would be useful. So there's some different resources, and I've included those on your resource paper, um, on your resource template, so that you would have that for reference. But just thinking about these challenges, some things that came to mind from my own classroom, and then just doing some research on this, I know that students will struggle defining systems and identifying components and inputs and outputs, and that could be a big stumbling block. That this idea of conservation of matter and energy, although I might be able to say that, really being able to account for that and why it's so important. I know that's going to be a challenge, especially at the sixth grade level. We're just, you know, we're trying to think like this. How does water interact with different kinds of matter? Why would one landscape be in one part of the world, but not in another part of the world, if water's one of the major influencers? Often students think that the water cycle is like step by step instead of simultaneous. So how do I help students understand the dynamics of a cycle? And then we discuss this idea of scale, time and spatial scale that's gonna be so important. Students often think that living things are not a part of the water cycle and Transpiration is mentioned, but we're not talking about the biosphere. So how do I bring that in? And then I'm going to model this because it's going to help me begin to understand those interactions and account for inputs and outputs. But there are always limitations to a model. And how can I account for those limitations, yet the model still be useful? So really thinking about where those stumbling blocks might be are going to be helpful in 
the kinds of experiences I want students to have, and then how I support students in those experiences. So I would capture that on my standard analysis template as well. And then the very last thing that I think is important is maybe the most important of all, why do kids need to know this? Why does a sixth grader need to understand these systems and the cycling of matter and energy through a system? Why is that important to them? And thinking about this question is really helpful to me to begin to think about, well, what might be a phenomenon that a student might experience? What might be some examples around us or things that they might be familiar with and I could begin to tap into? So it might be things like, gosh, how can I account for mammoth caves? You know, such a wonderful example here in our own state that many of our students will have heard about. Or even more grand example, how can I explain the Grand Canyon? And why is it there and not someone somewhere else? What do I need to understand about that? Or, you know, why is it sometimes when I'm going home, I can't get home because my road is washed out? What's going on? Constantly eroding here. It happens on my lane going home, but it's not happening somewhere else. How can I begin to understand that? And then how can I prevent it? Or maybe even bigger ideas like, you know, 100 year droughts or 100 year flash flooding, things that we've never seen to the magnitude that we have. So how can I begin to understand if, if matters conserved and energy is driving these cycles, how can I count for the magnitude of these? Or maybe I need to understand this for an engineering purpose. You know, I live in a very arid part of the world, like um, the United Arab Emirates. How can I control this cycle? Maybe I can build a mountain and create my own weather and get my own recycling to happen at this particular place. So thinking about this, after I've looked at all those big pieces, those big components, is a way to help me think about what can I organize this around that students can figure out and then come to understand these big ideas as well as use these science and engineering practices. So what are some ideas that come to mind for you? So now it's your turn. You're going to practice clarifying the science idea that you identified earlier. If you're working in a PLC, you may want to work through the process with a partner for the same standard so you can share ideas and insights, or you may want to divide and conquer so that you can clarify more standards that way. It's really what works best for you. Utilize the steps that are detailed on the slide, and there are places with links to the different resources that I've mentioned and shared uh, examples from on that organizer. Hopefully that'll make it a little simpler to locate everything. And just copy and paste in, add your own ideas where important, strike through things that are not gonna be a part of this learning that you're thinking about for right now, but clarify a science idea. I think it's incredibly important that you make a record or keep this record of clarification. So using the organizer is a nice way just to have all the information in one place so that you can go back and refer to that when you get ready to teach the unit, as well as when you're designing instruction and assessment to go along with it. So you might wanna start a folder where you keep this information and, um, each member of your PLC, your grade level group, your department can access that information as well in kind of the divide and conquer thing. So pause the video and clarify the standard you pre-selected. And this might be a good place to pause, give yourself some time, and then when you come back to your next PLC meeting, bring that clarification with you 
to be able to share with your colleagues. In session two, we focused on getting clear on science ideas that our students will need to make sense of a phenomenon to answer a driving question. We began by accessing your prior knowledge about disciplinary core ideas and capturing that on the science ideas note-taking organizer. And as a PLC, I hope that you captured your group's ideas on a chart so that you could build a collective understanding of disciplinary core ideas. We have this common understanding within our PLC. Then you read an excerpt from the framework of the committee's description of the disciplinary core idea and their rationale for using them. You may have finished this section by revising your group's description of what a DCI is and is not. After deepening our understanding, we considered how using a sense-making frame for instruction through the use of DCIs impacts our curricular decisions, how we design instruction, and how we assess students in our classrooms to determine their understanding. We followed this up with practicing clarifying a science idea or unpacking a standard. The orange section of your selected resources sheet has links to several resources you can use to clarify the science ideas you want students to learn. And also on the standard analysis template, many of the links that go to the free resources are included there. So let's take a moment to reflect on where we are with this idea of clarifying science ideas. Let's take a minute to think about what are your strengths with respect to this? What are some needs that you have? What resources do you have? What resources might be useful to obtain? And then what are your next steps and a time frame for implementing them? So go back to your sense-making plan of action organizer that we started in session one. Take a minute to reflect. If you're working in a PLC, give each individual some time to reflect individually. And then again, pull your ideas. Look for those strengths from each other. Are there common needs? Are there resources we could share or something that we need to acquire? So I'd like to sum up this session two video with a couple of quotes that I think might be helpful. Science ideas, those elements of the disciplinary core ideas, are fundamental ideas that are necessary for understanding a given science discipline. The core ideas all have broad importance within or across science and engineering disciplines. They provide a tool for understanding or investigating complex ideas and solving problems. They relate to societal or personal concerns and can be taught over multiple grade levels at progressive levels of depth and complexity. And this is a definition of disciplinary core ideas that comes from the glossary on the nextgenscience.org site. So I thought I kind of summed up some of those big ideas that we talked about in the session today. And then really understanding what the standard says, what the core idea is all about, is important for being able to design those sense-making experiences for students. So pursuing a question students raise about a phenomenon they have experienced together, then students are gonna engage in science and engineering practices to make sense of targeted science ideas that they need to explain how or why the phenomenon occurs. So all of those components that we looked at for sense-making are just interconnected. 
and understanding the science ideas helps me think of a phenomenon. It helps me determine what science and engineering practices to help students leverage and to develop their understanding and use of through this unit of study, as well as how to leverage their thinking, what they know, and tap into that social nature of learning by sharing ideas and growing ideas together. So what are you and or your PLC members taking away about sense making that maybe you hadn't considered before, or maybe you've had reinforced in these first two videos. Why is it important to spend time clarifying science ideas? What happens if you don't? I think those are some important questions to consider. And I look forward to sharing with you again as we continue our deep dive into sense making in session three, where we're going to look at how do I use phenomena to support students' sense making? Thank you.